Yo, everybody, welcome back to another Bug Junkie podcast. Guys, we're back in the studio today. Finally got us some nice spring weather. It's warming up. Getting there. It's still I'm getting up. cold at night. I mean, we still got long sleeves on. <clears throat> I don't know about y'all. I'm sitting in shorts and a oh, I got shorts a, on. I got a short sleeve shirt. Mikey's got his jacket on. I know. I didn't put my jacket on. I, yeah. Well, I don't got in the habit of wearing shorts all the time, get these old legs tying. I hear you. But I get cool in the morning. I get cool in the morning, so I put a jacket it's, on. It's time to hang up the camo now. All the seasons, turkey seasons done closed on us. Yeah. It's time to break out the fishing gear. Fishing shirts. Now, we're on the countdown. We got us a redfish trip coming up, guys. This month? Well, is it? Yeah. It's the end of the month. Yeah, yeah. month. We're, we're about four, four and a half weeks away, I guess. Yeah. I'm ready. Yeah, I'm excited. I've been I've been seeing them post some pictures of some big fish, big bull reds they've been catching down there. I've never been. So Dude excited. brought me some uh, trout. He's been down there. <clears throat> His wife's a travel nurse, and they've been living down in South Louisiana. And he's been catching. He's a, he's they're from like the UP of Michigan, and they catch some big lake trout and smoke them. Well, he caught some uh, specks down yeah. there and smoked them and brought me some. Man, they're dang good. I put together a little dip with it. Like yeah, a I like smoke, smoke trout, trout dip. Oh no, we didn't get none. It was good. I still got it at the house. I need to bring it up here and let y'all try it. You it that? was fine. And I, I didn't ask him. Like I didn't ask him what he smoked it on. But he he he, he said he uh, it wasn't a cold smoke. It was like two fifty, two seventy five, and uh, smoked it till it flaked. But it's dang good. <laughs> what are you getting tickled about? Mark. What's got you tickled? Mark and his pen. If anybody, ever know, if anybody knows Cowell. the podcast, Mark's always doing this. At the I can't pencil. sit still. Okay, you got to fidget. <laughs> you got to do got something. Fidgets. So I set my <laughs> pen down and I almost picked yeah. it right back up. I got it, though. Well, well, last week we got to talking about it was Jamie's week, and we got to talking about what it's like to uh, start looking for or find a new land to lease or, or, you know, new clubs to join. This is kind of the time of the year where people are finished up with turkey season. So, that, you know, people are there's, – there's spots open now. So if you're looking yeah. – this is the time of year you want to be looking. We also uh, talked a little bit about Mark. You was going to buy a kayak. Did you? Did you? I do ain't bought one yet. You didn't pull we had had one. Time. Yeah, we've been, yeah. been busy. So what have y'all been doing? Cooking hogs. Yep. How many does this make? Like contest wise, or, or just, just hogs hog in general? Well, just contest hog. Con- so y'all are in the running for like in the NBN Hog Team of the Year yeah. now, right? We're number two right now. Which I mean, we it's still we got a long real way early, to go, yeah, and yeah. I mean, first place is a little bit more in front of us because they've they've done very very well, and it's a, it's a lot of good hog teams out there. So it's about winning them or about being consistent when you cook them. Consistent, but that's what that's what it takes. Yep, I've never ran for team of the year or anything. I don't know that we're running, but we're going we're going to walk with it and see what happens. Yeah. How many more do you think you have to cook to even? We're so definitely going to do the change. Delta series, which is a total of five cooks. Yeah, uh, you got well, the, you got to do at least three out of the five, and it's the highest total combined, combined score. points. Wins of the, the of two. five or of three. I think you gotta do at least three. But yeah. I mean, does it take five to win it though? Probably more than likely. Yeah, or I mean, or doesn't that other? You, if you miss one, you pretty much you're, you're out. Yeah. yeah. So y'all <clears throat> finaled for the first time, and that means you made the top three. Top all, three. Right? Yep. We were one into finals in second place, and if you don't know finals, you got to do on site presentation. That's when the judges come to you. Me or Jamie has never done that. Yeah. And if you was to ask me today what I told them judges, I don't know because I'm pretty sure I blacked out and we just rolled through this field. Like I, <laughs> was a good hog. It was a very good hog. Yeah. Um, we When's I the was next I, one? this weekend. The total hogs we've cooked three contests out of four. That's actually a, were going on and total hogs for the year we've probably cooked twelve or fifteen. Yeah, probably. At least. Man, y'all getting up there cooking hogs now? We've cooked a lot. We're going we to all end up with the gout. <laughs> Mikey, you was cooking crawfish the weekend before. Did you have to go sell any more this weekend? No, I, I got out of it this weekend. Did you? I had to do some honey doing, build my raised you, beds for my garden. Oh, is it time to put yeah. some tomato plants in the ground? It's time. It's time. My honey do list is like ridiculously long right now. I know. I'm, I am I, I love going home, but then I walk around the yard and I see all this crap I got to do that yeah, I get aggravated. Hunt like, season, I'm like, yeah. hey, God. Just neglect it. Yeah, yeah, it's neglected. Yeah, flower I got a, beds and gardens and everything. Yeah. It's bad. I got picked everything limbs. neglected. I went to camp and uh, Saturday and rode around, checked things out, looked at uh, all the plots. Man, our plots, our summer plots are they're, they're ready. It's about time, it's time to start getting on those. But we got all that grain. We got a bunch of clover that we got to make a decision on what we're going to do with it. If we're going to keep some of it. We're gonna spray it and terminate keep it. it, spray it and kill it. You think? Spray it and keep it. Spray it and keep it. I keep think we it. do too. But it's done. 
So that was what I wanted to talk to y'all about a little bit real fast was on clover. How far, how tall is too tall? Because we've already, we've got flower, all the red clovers flowered out, all the white clovers flowered out. You cut the flowers was, off and nothing else. You want it down, but you don't want it like manicured like your long cut. No, it'll burn up. You got to leave it like what, eight inches or something like that? <clears throat> Probably over, a little over ankle deep would be ideal. I mean, that, that would give you that six to eight inch height. But I mean, like right now, some of that stuff that we've got is competing for sunlight. So it's got stalky. Yeah. If you go out there and bush hog it now, it's dead. There, yeah. I did notice there's a lot of those areas that were the drought hit it so bad last year, knocked out clover mm-hmm. where we didn't have any in the fall. It's all, it's come mm-hmm. back. Yeah. So that, that root bank system is there. Yeah. yeah that, that, it's that under the ground. There. So we're getting places filling in. I mean, that you know, clover, it's, it's pretty invasive it is. when you get it going. Like it, it wants to stay there. We hadn't done anything to some of that. I got a heck of a spot coming up my driveway right now that I have no idea where it come from. Just clover in the Just driveway. White clover. South side driveway, yeah. I must build some seeds. I've I seen a lot. <laughs> Like right now in places that I've, I've like just riding down the road, like it's on the side of the road, it's in people's cow pastures. It is everywhere right now. And I think from all that drought, I think it come back with a vengeance like right now, you know, from all yeah. the rain we've had and it's sprouting back up. I mean, because everybody's clover and stuff was pretty much ruined last year. So I was going to ask you on our fall plots last year, you know, you plant clover, you usually plant it with a nurse crop, like some grains or something. Mm. Did we mix clover in every single plot last fall? So it was in. So that's a lot of that white clover we're seeing was planted before deer season mm. last fall, and now it's just now getting to where it is. Some of it, and some of it is is stuff that may have already been there. Yeah, that, was, that we had from previous we just, years. Yeah, you know, and it, it had dried out. So I really, you know, when I sprayed, it was already, you know, late in the summer, and it was already kind of dead. And we, you know, we disc it up, but still that root, like you said, that root system still there. So some of it's coming back from previous years what are you going what are you going to spray clover with this year um if it's if it's just the grass and the grains is out there i'll spray it with clethodum but if i see any broadleaf you know some of those wild greens and some of that you know bigger broadleaf plants that kind of stick up through there i'll put some 24 db in there it's got to be db B, yeah not 24 what is that butyrac or something like that so Man, I, I think that's what it is yeah sure but <laughs> we need, i want before we you know before we <laughs> Get in. Well, I guess we could probably do this anytime this summer, but I wanted to do like a podcast just on clover because you talked to John about it, our John Deere guy. Yeah. And he was like, that's all he wants to do. <clears> yeah. He land, said, right? you know, he's tried everything and for the money and repeat plots coming back, he said, hands down clover. It, it, well, you get so much repeat growth out of it. Like if you, if you got to stand a good white clover, it'll, it'll last five to seven years if you yeah. take care of it. Now, if you a, don't get hit with drought too bad. Yeah. And I think it is a difference in, I think Imperial is what they use, but yeah. it's a difference between like a, you go to Walmart and buy a clover off the shelf versus you buy a There's higher, a lot higher. of different breeds of clover. Yeah. That people don't, I don't even know. <clears throat> right. I mean, I would, 20, 25. I was just looking at some, some notes that I had made years ago that you know, it was like a clover demonstration mm-hmm. or, you know, how to do it. And I was all the breeds and pictures of the guy I had. It was amazing how many different ones there were. But they're for different regions too, though. Yeah, like some of that stuff we can't grow down here. Some of it they grow with alfalfa out west. I mean, there's stuff that you know we never grow alfalfa down here. But most of our southern region stuff is grown with a nurse crop. The yeah. first year lets the root system establish. Then it, I guess, it provides you know a, keep the weeds out when they start coming because you got that nurse crop of weed or mm. rye or whatever it is in there and then you kill that and let the clover come on yeah you spray it down that's where we're at yeah because it's, it's hard to it's kind of hard to kill clover i mean i've sprayed it with roundup before and it but you know it dried out and kill it but it wasn't long you know yeah. a few rains or so and it'd come right on back well i see it in pastures and i guess they i mean they use it for grazing mm. you know some some farmers plant or ranchers plant clover in some of their you know pasture land Hell, it's and not it's, like turnip and, greens. And does, once they get it planted, it don't. You know, the cows don't. They eat it, but it don't stop it from coming back year after year. Oh, because them cows that eat all that clover down there. That one year we had all them clover plots. I mean, they, Lord, it cleaned them out. <laughs> them jumping. Yeah, we got, we got fertilizer off everywhere. Them. We got fertilized that year without having to spend any money. Going back to the crawfish thing, we do have uh, some crawfish festivals coming up. I want, and I I put this down since it was my week. I want to give a shout out to the guys down in Metairie. The Old Metairie Crawfish Festival. 
is happening. What did I put a date on? May 13th. May the 13th. And for $35, you can go down there and eat all you want of crawfish. I judged it last year. We talked about that last week. But um, that's a good one. If anybody's down in that area in Metairie, they're in May. We're not going to be there because of Memphis in May this year. We'll be loading in. But that's a fun. Have y'all ever been to a crawfish festival? I've been I been to know if it, the one in Tunica. Crawfish Alley. Yeah, Crawfish Alley that in was Tunica. One of the first ones I ever went to. It was called the Tunica Rivergate Fest. Crawfish Alley was a fundraiser for one of their schools down there. And man, that was some dang good crawfish. I'm, that's what I was going to say. For them to be cooking thousands thousand pounds. pounds batches I at a time, that is the best crawfish I've had. They cooked 35,000 pounds this year. I was no was telling. That's There's another uh, first time one this year. Our buddy Stale Cracker is doing one at his place at the end of June. I think it's like June 24th. Don't check me on that, but it's called the Two Step uh, I did see that. Festival. First annual crawfish cook. He's having a cook off. Let's go. You, <laughs> he called me already. I think I'm going to go down there and hang out. I don't know, but uh, that'd be a good one to go. I'll go cook it. You want to go to it's, it's uh, Kenneth, uh, Kenner, Louisiana, just down 55 from us. What weekend? About, I want to say it's the 24th of June or something like that. I have to look it up. It's on his. He posted on his Facebook. It's called the Two Step First Annual Crawfish Cookoff for his Cajun Two Step. He's people there. He's opening up mm. a new shop down there. It's kind of an inaugural thing. It's going to be. He said he was going to have beer, and daiquiris, <laughs> snowballs for the kids. There's no crawfish how many cookoff. Will be there. Oh, it'll be big. Jambalaya. He's, he's opening a shop. Yeah, he already had a little shop, but I guess he built him a new shop down there. So. Selling like product and things like yeah, that. Yeah, I think cooking so. Cooking, doing cooking stuff and all kinds of stuff. That's good. But when does what's, what's crawfish season pretty much end up here? June. Yeah, about the first no. part of June, isn't it? It's it goes. Like, that's pretty much it. I mean, you yeah. can still get them, but you don't want to. They're hard by then. Yeah, I wonder how the crawfish going to be that late in the year. <laughs> they're on, they're I mean, quite I mean, different down there on farms, though. Well, see. That's where you get them from. But, I mean, I think a lot of them, like Arkansas farms, come in late. So they get a lot of crawfish from Arkansas. Or they used to. I don't know if they still do. Did you know that time we tried to cook them after Memphis and May? Man, they were so hard, and I mean, you couldn't. You had yeah. to cook the fire. We're, up. we're used to. I mean, I think all the ones we get come out of the river basin down there. They're not as much. I mean, you can tell because we've got. You know, you can tell the difference when you look at them. Some of them that bright red. Some yeah. got that white bottoms or whatever. And the ones we were getting earlier in the year were coming out of that river. The what's it? I forget which basin it is, but. I can't we were either. getting some of those, and then we got some of the farm ones, and the farm ones to me got hard. Yeah, the red, the ones that get real bright red, or dark red, almost, almost black. black. Yeah, they get too hard. That it may. We need. I need to cook some. Can't do it this weekend. I might do it next Saturday. I definitely had an eight month share of them this year. Do it the Saturday after load in or before load in. Well, Mike, you rode down. And checked on things Sunday after I had left. I saw you on the cameras riding around. Well, uh, what all did you notice going on at the farm? I mean, it's 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 wild down there right now. I mean, it's it's a jungle. I mean, those spring rains, that warm weather, it's everything is taking off. Storms, the rains, the yeah. We got some more trees down on top of the ones that went down during the ice and stuff. I don't. I guess one of those storms that came through down there blowed a few down. Um, I did see those. Um, which is a good thing. I was gonna. I, I wanted to ask you that, or what y'all's thoughts were on it. What I mean, I know you want to get the stuff off your trails and everything. Yeah. But how important is it to move those down trees or to get them cut up? Because to me, I don't. There's I don't a, want to. It promotes like undergrowth, bedding areas. I mean, what do y'all think about that? Yeah. I mean, the only one I see down there, I think we need to get is the one right there by Wayland Stand. You know, just get it off the plot to where you can see down that road good and ain't blocking your vision. And it's I a wouldn't good old, touch that one. You believe it? Yep. The one that's kind of on the corner of the plot. Yeah, right there on the, right there. Yeah. Soon, as soon as the heel breaks over, we I mean, got, cut it. Out, I mean, cut it out where you can see. But I wouldn't. I mean, it it breaks you up, and plus, it's it's going to have a lot of value to the animals moving back and forth through there. I think I that's mean, what I was thinking on some of those. I mean, you've got treetops that are down like that that are still holding their lease and putting out green just because they broke. And I know they're going to die. Yeah. They're not going to stay there, but you think of all that cover and the, it gives places for briars to grow up and just other browse for them to grow around those treetops. I mean, I know it don't look good, and that's what I was riding around looking at. It's like you want a property, the aesthetics of it looks like a golf course and all that. It's not going to hold deer. No. But you get property where you've got a natural look to it, where Mother Nature's knocking trees down and it's growing up and all that. Those are going to be your places that hold your deer. And we've, we've, 
you know, we, yeah, I'll say we, at first, you know, that, that was kind of the, I guess the theory behind what we were going to do with the property down there. I mean, you know, we, Jamie was bush hogging and keeping it kind of cleaned out and cleared, or we had a guy cutting hay off of it and stuff like that. And you kind of seen where cutting hay was the worst thing we done. Yeah. Yeah. It kept, it, it took clean two years to get that back. We were keeping everything bush hogged and manicured and stuff like that. And it was, I mean, look, we good. were seeing deer, but it wasn't, we weren't holding deer. Yeah. Yeah. We were seeing them. They were just, you know, it was evening times, early morning, mm-hmm. stuff like that, but we weren't holding deer. So that That's, is going to lead into what I wanted to talk today about. Because I know it's time to start talking about summer plots and stuff, but holding deer. What is it? So now you've got a pro- we've got a property that we've been working on that deer are living there. They're staying there. They were when it was being manicured and cut, and pristine looking show off property. Deer would come on it, but they weren't staying on it. They would yeah. come through, eat, and leave. Now they're living there. Yeah. We're seeing it on our cameras. You're seeing it when you go right around. You're seeing the way that the property's changed. What is it going to do when we go in to put in these summer plots? Are we going to run our deer off by, are you, by accessing the land, by doing all this work? We're going to talk about that before, today. Before we get to that, right now, you look how grown up, right now where all the cameras are, all that wheat standing, everything, how thick it is. How many deer are we seeing this within two and three feet of the camera? They are on it, man. And They're... that's not counting how many. You can't see, but maybe five. Realistically, you might see five yards. Yeah, because it's so thick. And we're seeing, we're getting 30, 40, 50 pictures a day off each camera. That's not counting what's in the back of that food plot you're not even seeing. So this is the first time that we've ever left these cameras out this long and that made sure they were working and operating. Because we always, after deer season, you know, we're through with it. But we wanted to see turkeys this year. We wanted to see how the deer were growing, see what happened to them, try to see if our bucks are going to start putting back on horns if they're looking healthy. And that was the whole reason why leaving them out. And you're exactly right. We are seeing we more even, deer now than we did back during deer season. I we've mean, been seeing a Loch Ness monster. I don't know what. Did that you ever was. figure out what that was? It looks like a snake standing up. Man, I don't know. It ain't. I, I ain't got it. the. Yeah. I, I don't get it. I don't know what camera's on because it ain't on the. I don't think it was a, a hen because it. Or it looked just like one of them old, like you used to read in your old English book where they got the Loch Ness monster in the background. Yeah, yeah, that's what it was in the in the wheat. <laughs> Coming up out of the wheat. But so Mikey riding around, I could see where well, first off, I ran deer out of just about every yeah. field. But you could tell they are just mashing it down yeah. everywhere. There's there was trails, trails and, and you could tell where they've been walking in there and feeding. And of course, I mean we knew that from the cameras, but all of those Food plots are just there's just trails in there, and it's it's all kinds of animals in there right now, turkeys and deer and everything yep. out there feeding in there, picking at that clover, and you know some of those softer grains that are still out there. I'm, I've seen a doe, you know, she had a mouthful of wheat. I don't know if she accidentally got it or what. Yeah, but it was a you know six eight inch long wheat that she was sitting there. Chewing it should on. be way too mature because yeah. I mean, a lot of that a lot of that grain's already had starting to head out. It ain't starting to dry up yet, but it's heading out. Yeah. Something else heading out. Bucks already got horns they, coming they on. Already got horns. Oh. Or excuse me, antlers. Yeah, <laughs> got antlers. They're popping out already. That was <clears> fast <throat> to me. I've yeah. never noticed. The, like, like we just dropped two or three weeks ago, if that. It ain't been long. Ain't, a month. Maybe. It ain't. Been, I don't even know month, if it's been a yeah. full month. Yeah, they're putting right back on. I tell you, what Mark said earlier about seeing you know does that still hadn't dropped phones on there. You know they're still you know. Yeah, we had that doe yesterday that come across heartbreak that you could tell. She big girl. She holding. <laughs> well, you said you saw a big red deer, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, I seen I seen a couple of bucks when I was riding around down there, and like you could tell. I mean, you could tell he was a buck. You know, just his shoulders and his Stout. rear end, and just a, the girth of him. You know how how yeah. stout he was. You know, you barely could see something on his head. I couldn't really tell what he was, but man, he was muscular. He was filled out, which makes me feel good because. Usually this time of year, if you terminated all those plots and stuff, they don't have nothing to eat, you know, especially with the density we have. So before we leave, talk about the conditions of things. What uh, Did y'all notice anything on the water the way we, you know, we had some erosion problems. We had standing water in some plots. And last year we rented some equipment to hopefully alleviate some of that spring runoff. What did y'all think about how some of that's working? I mean, mud hole looks pretty dang good. Yeah, I don't mud, think mud it ever hole, it didn't I, ever blow out or anything. No, I don't think it got over that little levee you made. No, it didn't. So you know the equipment we used and the ditches that we made, um, they're working now. You know, of course they they'll be need to be maintained over the years. You know, as stuff falls in them or gets blocked up or silty in and stuff like that. But 
uh, the roads that we, you know, kind of cleaned off and, you know, got rid of some of those old mud holes. There was no mud holes in that main entrance to Salem like it was before. You know, used to you went down the road and you was dodging yeah. mud holes. There's none of those. Um, all that's working. Um, all the stuff that Miles did down in the lower field, there's there's one little spot when you come up in the field over here to the left that's not draining quite right, but it's yeah. just a small spot. It ain't. That's right there in the side. corner, ain't right it? Right there in the corner. Low spot. But where... the majority of the field is dry. You can ride the field now. You used to last year when this time of year you could not go across that freaking field. Is oh. how like I know you said everything's dry, but is the field like dry enough to pull out on and stuff now? Hmm? Yeah. Because uh, I talked to Miles a while ago. Lime is delivered. All right, cool. So he's gonna meet us down there tomorrow too. Yeah. It it was it was. I mean, the fields are damp, but they're not nasty. Yeah. But we've had a ton of rain too, though. Yeah. See, last year when I was planting that corn, like I, I'll give you for instance, like that mark plot field down there where it's just it's rotten all the time. I was I drug a, you know, I planted it when it was kind of dry, but I came back with that fertilizer buggy. Son, it was marring up. It was nasty down there. It was it was fixing to swallow that fertilizer buggy. This year, it's nowhere near that. So our our, our drainage problem on that big field is that somewhat correct. It's a lot better. Yeah, I don't know if it's hundred percent corrected, but it's, yeah, it's correct. But it's enough. working working towards yeah. the right. We're, we're, it's we're going, going the right way. Yeah. Well, good. Well, going back to that main idea. So you've been down there. Uh, riding around, checking on things. Might have had, Mikey has. I don't think, Jamie, you've been down much lately. But uh, what do y'all think about putting in these plots, what it's going to do? Are we fixing to run off these deer that we have worked hard to try to hold mm-hmm. on the place? No. Yeah, do we have different thoughts on this? Or I mean, My, So we're going down there in the morning. We're going to start bush hogging and trying to get some stuff opened up. Like, say, Miles is coming down to start getting lime out this week. And... The only thing I'm concerned with now is if we have some early drops in phones and stuff like that in that thick cover, in that wheat. And my thinking tomorrow is what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull the tractor down the food plot and I'm not going to fire the bush hog up. I'm just going to kind of make a loop, a perimeter loop around each food plot and just look and see what's out there before I start bush hogging. But that would be my only concern. You ain't going to run deer off. It's too much food there. I mean, the the food that we've, the food that we've got out there now is holding them. Um, the one thing you think that you, that's what's keeping them there—the the food. Or? Well, it's it's the food and the cover. I mean, we we've got cover that we've created over the past couple of years. You know, grass and things like that. It's close to the food plots. Um, Salem, not so much. We did leave that uh, edge around there, but right now that edge is down. Yeah. It is laid down. I no, did notice that a lot of that grainy stuff and that grass is you know over the, I guess over the course of the past couple of months of rain and storms and stuff like that, a lot of that stuff is mashed down. It is brittle, is rotted, and it's fell to the ground. And there's not as thick cover there as it was before. But out there in the food plots, it is. You know, that grain is up, and it's about, see, some of it's about waist high. Yeah. So, you know, kind of like Mark was saying, I'm, I'm a little concerned. I rode Sunday over the whole field. Me and Melissa did just looking, make sure there wasn't no turkey nest, make sure there wasn't no fawns bedded out in there, you know, in, in that big plantation field. Um, and that, that's what they're going to be looking for come summertime. You know, when those fawns start dropping, they, they want that grass. They want that thicket. They want that stuff to put those fawns in. Same way with the turkeys. You know, everything's nesting and dropping, and they want that cover to be able to hide in. And uh, you need to be aware of that. You don't want to get out there and start bush hogging and run over a fawn because they're not able to – they ain't gonna get up and run. They're not gonna Which get up and run. Shouldn't, it shouldn't be any fawns just yet. We're shouldn't still be. early. Yeah, our early rut, fawns. Our rut was what December. Yeah, I mean, our main you, rut. There you might get a little a in November, but not much. So you're looking at about a six to seven month period yeah. there. So it should be in the May, fawns. first of June. Yeah. Um, I know, Jamie, you've been down there before and seen some fawns. Yeah, I don't, the tractor, yeah. But that's been like so the second yeah, bush yeah. hog, right? Like. Yeah, that was Memorial yeah. Day. Yeah, I mean, it was all, all. Matter of fact, all of my ever jumped up was all around the pond stand and that area. Yeah. So what I'm thinking, so my main concern is, isn't like running over fawns or spooking them off like that. It's that once you take out what they're eating now, are they going to leave because we take that take those plots out? We're looking at roughly 35 acres that we're going to. But we're not taking all of them out. We want to think, some of you're it. Still, or, you still have that yeah. clover. We talked about how much we like clover. That's always going to be there. You're still going to have, I mean, natural foliage is still going to be there. I mean, I'm sure there's plenty of vegetation coming up in the thickets now. You know, yeah. I don't know if there's like berry bushes and stuff like that that's going to start blooming. And 
Briars are turning green. Briars are turning green. I don't. I mean, you're probably going. They'll probably stay off the plot that day. They coming yeah. back out there though. Well, that was what I was going to say because how many times have y'all been? You've been on the tractor to where there's been deer in the plots, and they might look at you, but you got to get right up on them before oh, yeah. they're going to run. Yeah, yeah. most yeah, most times if you don't stop, if you just move, and they're going to stand still unless you try to go on by them. I, I mean, have y'all had them just stand out there and graze while you're in the field working? I filmed those last year. Yeah, yeah. thirty yards from me. I was oh, you were I, on the tractor. I was on the tractor. I opened the door, got out of the tractor because I had to move a limb. They never moved. They stayed right there and fed the whole time. And then, heck, man, you flew the drone on them ones. Yeah. So the premise of scaring them off by doing your plots is probably busted because there is not going to. You don't think it's going to phase them at all. I don't, I don't think, think so. they see uh, agriculture equipment as a threat. I mean, we're using the we're we're cutting and working with the deer. <laughs> so, I mean, <laughs> I they know it's one of them. I think that's what it is. Yeah. The, the green one. The green one. Now the side by side, maybe. Well. <laughs> I mean, I know, like, come deer season, when they're getting pressured, I mean, that's, and that's what it's about. How much, how much pressure are you going to put on them? If you were in there every single day with that tractor, every single day during the summer, you're probably going to run them off somewhat. I mean, if you kept them run but, out all the time, yeah, maybe. But so. now they're going to, I mean, we're hoping, like, just to get in, get the plots in, and then come up out of there and don't go back for a Which, while. That's the thing. We got a lot of small plots. You're in and out <laughs> within less than an hour of yeah. each, each one yeah. of them. Look at it this way. You go up to Indiana where Jay's at. Some of the biggest bucks we've ever heard of or seen killed come from up there. And what is it? Nothing but thousands of acres of farmland oh, yeah, that yeah. they work every day in the summer. Well, that's what I was going to say. A lot of this land where we see just riding around, it's farmland. We see deer in every afternoon. Every afternoon. And they're not spooked out from it. They're staying where the food is. but uh, And I was like, you know, are they going to move to go somewhere else where there's more food? No, if you get well, the bush hog and run it smack down the middle of their bedding area, yeah, they're probably going to get out of that yeah. bed and area and find somewhere else to go. And whether or not it's on your property or not, you don't know. But I mean, I, and it's, I, I agree with that. I think one mistake we did make last year was when we rented some of that equipment, we probably mulched some areas too much, especially like – Too that, close to that hunt. Yeah, that South Trump area, we call yeah. it down there. We cleaned some stuff off. Now, it needed cleaning off. It was trash. We sacrificed it for that year. But now, next year, hopefully we're going to let it grow in something that's more manageable for us. Or something that's and good for the environment. more cover, yeah. So you don't want to take out that cover, especially like right now. And yeah. that's that goes back to is you know we talked about hacking squirt earlier in the year. That's another way to get in your property, to get rid of some of that stuff without being overly invasive on the property and pushing deer out. I think you need to have a strategy that that you need to know that any kind of major like land work or motion and things like that, you want to try to do that now. That way, that 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 property may have a chance to recover. Yeah. Um, you know, which with mulching, that's a pretty dense, heavy mulch that you put down out there. So it's kind of hard for stuff to come up. But eventually, stuff will start growing back in that in that mulch and coming back. But I don't. I, we messed up by doing that late in the season and leaving just a bare ground, and then winter came straight in and there was nothing. So it was just a desert. Um, we Even did. weeds couldn't come back. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, so we, you know, we, yeah, we did sacrifice, but that was just the time of the year that we could get it and get down there and do yeah, it. We yeah. just had to do it when we could do it. It's better not doing it. I think that pertains to everybody. You have to do it when you mm -hmm. can. You mean yeah. you'd like to have a perfect schedule? That hillside would be South Trump would be a good place to do that. Uh, what you call it, standing wall or whatever that girl wall, 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 yeah. wall yeah. stuff. That that kind of brings me into this. Is all right. So we're going to start bush hogging tomorrow. Do we see a benefit or do we want to? Leave an eco edge of what's already I think growing so everywhere. I think so. So, like, just don't you know leave five yards from the <laughs> tree line tomorrow, and just bush hog and leave that standing wheat. It's already there. Yeah, we're and that not, can be your summer eco edge. Before, yeah, before we start down there, we need to definitely think about how we're going to do it because we don't want to just bush hog everything. Yeah, I mean, right, right now, like I said, I mean, you're all right. So all that Egyptian wheat and grass Sudan, and all, all that, that stuff that was in that was in that mix, and even the Johnson grass right now. Johnson grass is going to recover very fast, so you know Ten once we yeah year. once we go down there and bush hog about the time we bush hog it, it's going to start getting ready to start growing, and within weeks it'll be back up. And then the goat weed will come in. Yeah, so uh, you don't want to you don't want to if you have grass there, I guess it would be smart to leave it if you can leave it, you know. But we've got a you know we're planning on planting all that growing the wall stuff back in there. I mean we've already bought that stuff. Yeah. 
we're definitely going to put some. So we, that's that's one thing you need to decide. Like when you're going to put in your summer plots, and you know you're going to, you know, establish an edge, mm. and you want to do that, you need to have that going in into the season. You need to have a game plan for yeah. it instead you, of just going you, out there and saying we're going, you know, try to do it here. You need to have it mapped out. There's easy. What is it? Onyx, Hunt Stand. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's a bunch of 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 uh, apps that aren't very expensive to have a you know to have now where you can plot your plot. You know, you can go in there, and map them out, get the acreage. Yeah, but like Mark's saying, you know, if if you're not planting a specific you know mix or something like that around for your edges and stuff, you can leave. You already designate that area. Like I'm not touching it. It's just going to eventually come back and. The Johnson grass will grow back up in there, the sage. and You'll have to rotate it, right? <clears throat> You'll eventually cut it ever so often. You're going to have to cut it. Yeah. You'll <clears throat> yeah. start getting sweet gum trees and yeah. things like that come up in there. You need to get it But down. from year to year, you can kind of – and that's what we're doing with yeah. a lot of that 60-acre track that was all pasture. We've, we're finally getting it recovered into like a native-style grassland yeah. instead of just being pasture. Yeah. Like you know, bush hog, hay, hay fields, basically. And you want the, you want a variety of stuff. You want some small oh, yeah. twig trees in there because they, I mean, deer eat the buds off the trees and things like that. You want small little briar patches. You don't want head high briar patches. You know, it got like that behind our house uh, in several places. <laughs> yeah. And then the trees started coming up in it. And then you by the time you couldn't get in there to it to cut the trees down because they were engulfed in briars and they were not that you know trees you wanted. So, but like what I done. So where my property is is kind of. Behind Jamie and behind Mikey, I split the difference. When before we ever built our house, that's how just like Mikey said, it was nothing but junk trees, sweet gums, briar trees, and blackberry bushes. I'm talking about blackberry bushes as big as some people's houses. I mean, huge. And I would go about every year or two, I'd get a mulcher and I'd go in there and I'd take everything out that was not an oak tree or something that I thought I wanted to keep. And now, like my front yard between my house and the road is strictly nothing but oaks. I mean, there's a couple of more like Bradford pears and stuff like that that I need to get out. But over time, I mean, I've established a very, very good, I guess, forest, you'd call it. But just, I mean, it takes time. It takes years. And we're gradually getting that way now with the property down where we're at now. That's what, I mean, that's what we wanted to do. We took out a bunch of stuff that, you know, undes- it was all undesirable. I don't think you got any good trees no i mean we'd left all that i mean if you look right in my front yard right now like literally you step out my doorstep there's looks like a, it looks like i planted them they're in a perfect line of nothing but oaks and all it was was they were little saplings years ago that i just left didn't touch with the mulcher got everything out around them where they could get sunlight and guess what i mean they're 30 foot tall trees now you know i did notice this past weekend i kind of looked at the trees we had planted over the past couple of years and they're, I guess they're competing so much yeah. with all the stuff growing around them that they're not thriving at all. Uh, even after we fertilize them, they're still not. I mean, planting trees is, is and maintaining trees is tough. hard. Um, you know, you can put T post up next to them where you can see them and things like that. But, you know, you plant 200 trees, you're going to have to go spend a lot of money putting T post out. You put those tubes over them, that'll get them up long and leggy, but you still have to maintain that area as much as possible because they're competing for nutrients in the ground, which we put fertilizer pellets in and we thought that they would kind of take off and they're not really taking off like they It's one or two up there behind Pond Stand that's got up, you know, knee high, a little bit taller that are doing decent, but. A lot of those were that size when we put them in the ground. (laughs) They were were 18 inch trees when we planted them and they ain't done nothing. Even, I mean, you bush, you uh, weed eat it around, well, we around a lot them. last year. We eat it yeah, but around again, them. where we yeah. planted them, like Mike said, it's fighting for sunlight because yeah. that sage grass comes up instantly. It covers it. You yeah. can weed eat it today, and next week you have to weed eat it again. You know, it's totally different than having them in your yard because I, you know, I pulled up some saplings where my mother in law was at, at my, doing some work in our flower beds, and I told her there were some little oak saplings out there. I'd like to keep those and see if we could transplant them. Or I still got them in pots. Them jokers are four times the size. I was yeah. like, I went and yeah. looked at them another day. They're just in the shady spot at my house. I mean, I've got some trees in yeah. some pots, you know. <laughs> I was like, man, I need to get these down there and get them in the ground. But we had to get a backhoe they, to dig a hole big enough for them. And less than, I don't even, she must have got those back in the fall. And in less than six months, they've already tripled in size in a pot. And we didn't do nothing to them. Just put them in a place where they could get a little sunlight and a little rain. The persimmon trees, they de- they never had a chance. Yeah, I I looked at some of those and I don't know. 
Some Man, trees grow, trees grow too get. daggum slow, you know. Yeah. We're impatient. <laughs> and we said that when we planted them. These trees ain't for us. These trees are for Michael and Will and Gage and whoever else, yeah. you know, 20 years from Next now. Next generation. Yeah. It ain't for us. And some of them might survive that. But. If they ever get up if they ever get up to a certain size where they get up to where they start branching out and they're they're above the grass line, I guess you could say, yeah. you know, about chest high. Once they get up above that where they get enough sunlight, they'll start shading out a lot of stuff and they stop competing and they start taking over. Um, but you got to get them to that point. So when we get these summer plots in, how long do you think it'll be before the deer could actually browse them to where they got some fresh growth? Woo, man. Probably July. Be that well, long. no. They'd be sooner than that. Well, as soon as it starts coming up, they're going to hit them. I mean, as soon, that young, tender stuff starts hitting up, getting up. I mean, we seen it with the beans last year. Every time I put beans down, as soon as they break the ground, they start nipping them off. I mean, they'll walk out there in that dirt and just. That's uh, why we can't grow beans. <clears throat> no. We can't. They're just, and I thought about that this year. It's like we put beans in the ground, we're wasting our money. That's what I'm thinking. We go back and bush hog where that clover's at and then get that woods no-till drill and drill stuff in and still got clover to eat on until that other stuff comes up if we go that route. Would it, would it come up through the clover, though? <laughs> it's going to be competing for it, and you can't mow that clover. Cause so we did that we did that test pot last year. Yeah. I pl- you know, I planted I planted our mix into, into a, a straight clover plot. No-till drilled it straight into that. It, it came up a little bit, but I think it was competing with the cl- clover so hard because that clover stayed there all year. It stunted everything, and I even fertilized it and sprayed. And well, no, I did not spray because it was like there was so many different things coming up in there. But <clears throat> trying to fertilize that, I think a lot of the fertilizer went to the clover, and I think it was pulling away from the beans and stuff like that. Because those clover plots that I planted into were thick. You know, it wasn't just established sparse. Yeah, yeah, it was established clover plots, and I was like, well, let's run this mix of beans and cow peas and stuff down through there. We did get some up. They did come up above the clover, but the deer would nip it off. And once they nipped it off, you know, it was it was done. It was done. But it, you know, it, it didn't grow as good as going out there and one tilling th- and, and fertilizing and putting it down in, in good, fresh dirt. One thing I took from it last year from planting such a big mix was those deer are selective on mm-hmm. which and plants where. they want to eat. Because they will pick out the beans and they will pick out the buckwheat when it's the the right maturity for them and i mean that the peas they waited on peas we thought we had like we, we were pea farming <laughs> it looked so good yeah and then when they let them get over waist high right before they started putting on little peas wiped them out it was yeah. like it was like over one weekend they look like the apocalypse every, yeah <laughs> i thought we got invaded by army worms or something you know some kind of pea eating worm but the you know and you're right the the deer are selective like they'll they'll pick at clover and stuff like that that may be in that in those mixes or around when those beans come up as soon as those beans come up they want them they're gonna they're gonna get them as soon as they start putting on leaves they're gonna they're gonna bite them off and then the peas for some reason they don't really mess with those or the buckwheat until they get up to a certain height and then they within a week they'll just mow them down. They'll, they'll just take them out. But the beans they're getting as soon as they come out of the ground. As soon as they come out of the ground, they want the beans. They'll put back on one little set of leaves, but once they nip that <laughs> second one off, they're gone. Yeah. They, The vetch, I don't know. I mean, I, it's, it's hard to say about the vetch because we planted that last year. It never really got over ankle deep at, at any point. No, only in the cage. But they didn't eat it as soon as – I don't know that they were grabbing it as soon as it came out of the ground. I wonder if it actually – if it's not preferable to them until it gets to a certain stage, kind of like the buckwheat. Well, that, and I don't the, think none of them deer's ever seen vetch. No, you they know? didn't, you know, and that may have been a blessing to us last year. We may plant it this year, and they just eat it to the ground. Yeah. I mean, it'll keep coming back, but, I mean, did they, we, may, they may just eat it to the ground. Was any vetch planted in those clover pots to see if that vetch could withstand it? I mean, I, I well, I terminated the clover, to clover the in the pond stand where the vetch was at. I terminated it, sprayed it. All the vetch was terminated too, wasn't it? Yeah, and I came back and terminated the vetch. I did try to plant uh, our winter plot. I left a strip about 10 foot wide, 8 foot wide on the side to see if I could come back in and no-till into that vetch with our uh, fall plots. It didn't work. didn't work. Mm -hmm. It was too thick, you think? I think it was too thick, and it kept it shaded out. That and maybe the deer just – they were already eating that and browsing that that they browsed over the – 
you know the new stuff in there. I do know, like after talking to Darren, he said they had played. He planted some vetch over on Hard Point on you know on the other side of the levee. The deer aren't touching it. He said his vetch is. He still has it left over from the fall. It didn't die. It's still thick, and now he said it's knee high, <laughs> and the deer aren't eating it over there. Mm. And I told him, I mean, well, they probably got a little better ratio of deer yeah. than what we do because our deer start. They were starving. They were eating everything that we put out there. Yeah. And I think that's what got them on ours. So we'll, it'll it'll be interesting this year to see if they're more selective. Well, I wonder if he, after we've done some management, he needs to put a cage around them because he may not know that they're eating it. That, that's true. He may have so much that he don't know. Because I don't think he has a. Do you know if he has cages over there? He didn't say. I talked to him this morning about it, and he said he, he said he said he wasn't really hitting it very hard, yeah. or not like not near about in comparison to what we have. He said it looks good. His vet's just thriving, but and I don't know if it's the same. Same joint vets that we planted or not? My duck came from the same seed. Well, too. Once we get four or five of these plots done in vets, you know, it, our pressure may back off a lot. Yeah, so yeah, I was yeah. say ours may get up knee high. We only had one full field of vets, like, and they were. Year. I mean, yeah. now we had it in the mixes; it was out there, but we only had one just straight vetch field. You know, and they 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 stayed in it. They stayed in it all day long, all year long. That, that was the one to pond, right? Yeah, <clears> that was at pond. But you know the other the other fields they had they had already depl- diminished the freaking beans, beans and, and the else. peas and all the other stuff. So they were all kind of pulling to that field where that you know yeah. that veg was at. So I mean they weren't going to eat the grain sorghum right then or the you know what else would we have in there? They had grain sorghum and something else, milo and something else in there. They wasn't really fooling with that right off the yeah. right out of the gate. They just kind of let it go and eat everything else around it. The buckwheat. Mm-hmm. They yeah. let it. They let it. Sit they let it off. get for a little. Get up, and then I guess it. I guess it once it starts pulling certain sugars and things like that, or producing certain sugars, yeah. that's what when it's flowers. like desirable for them to eat and pal- more palate. Say that for me. Palatable. 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 <laughs> they like it <laughs> more. Tongue twisted. They like it more. Yeah. Like. Well, they, do you think so? Besides working in the plots, you think going in there and. Lane sharking limbs and cutting trails and all that. Is that going to disturb bedding areas and run them out? No, I don't. I don't think so. As long as you're not staying there doing it constantly. I mean, we we ran into properties that we hunted before where they put in pipelines. Uh, they put in a sewer line in one of the properties we were hunting in. Now you couldn't really kill deer right on that sewer line. They kind of stayed back away from it. You know, there was equipment out there seven days a week from daylight to dark. They stayed out there putting those sewer lines in. Now they didn't really stay around those sewer lines like they had had in the past when nobody was out there, but uh, you still seen deer. It, it it affected the movement a little bit, but it didn't affect the deer moving around the property. Um, it just, it just kind of changed their pattern sometimes. Well, that was the biggest thing I was, you know, thinking about. I mean, I'm not saying it's, you know, going to happen. It's going to run our deer off, but I don't, I think, to getting that food source for them is way more important or working on your habitat is way more important than the amount, you know, the chance that you might run them off. Oh, they'll come back for sure. They, they, they know what's there. Look how many deer you see along the interstate where it's just car 100% car. chaos. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they don't, they know. Doesn't I mean, phase them. I do think if you want to keep, uh, if you want to homestead, you I guess say homestead them. You ain't never yeah. homestead a deer. Right. That's a plus. Sounds like a good idea to yeah, me. Yeah. If you, if you get them to where they're, you know, you have those those does that are core does that are staying on your property. You know, we we read that that they have what a one square mile maybe. That that would kind of cover your property. So I don't want to deplete all of the food that's on the property. So I think having a, a good strategy going into the summer, knowing that we're going to maintain this clover plot, this clover plot, this clover plot. You know, and keeping a I don't know just you know, spreading out that buffet. Right. Yeah. So I mean, we got we got a couple of different places that we're going to keep those clover plots and maintain those clover plots for when we do terminate this big field or we do terminate, you know, some stuff around it, they'll just transfer over to, hopefully they'll just transfer over to those, but we still have that bedding out there for them to feel safe safe laying in and stuff like that. We've created that or started creating that. And now the deer are really going to move over to, once we terminate these plots, we're going to put our main crops in, our main, you know, protein plots in. Yeah. Uh, they'll just kind of go over to the clover and start kind of munching on it for a little while, and then once those other ones come up, you know they they've got that to go back and feed to. But it also probably take some of the pressure off of those bigger plots and those clover plots. So having a 
I think having a several different plots with different stuff in it, you know, having a summertime plot, but you have a year-round clover plot that you're maintaining kind of takes the pressure off of one or the other throughout the year and, and gives them a variety to be able to, to choose from. I, I, mean, I, I think that's more important than anything, having that variety, having something different because they're, <laughs> they're such a browse animal that they're not – they shouldn't just stay with one thing. No. Like when we saw them just hanging out in the veg plot, well, that tells me that there wasn't nothing else to eat. Why yeah. else are they just hanging out there? Because they should move around, eat you know, eat some briars here, eat some clover here, eat some vetch, whatever, you, whatever you got, berries, nut acorns. But when it's all gone, they ain't got but one place to go. We see that in the winter. I mean, they they do have to. Yeah. When your food source is limited, they got to stay there. It's it's no different. The deer the deer's variety of food in their travel patterns, feed patterns are no different. No different in the summer than they are in the winter. It, they they ch- I say they they change. Acorns drop, they're going to hit acorns. Acorns stop dropping, they go back to some kind of sear of rain or some kind of browse that may be in the woods that we don't see. Will it be, you know, buds on twigs that are popping out or something? You know, there's a lot of things we don't see. In, that they eat? That they eat that they prefer over your beans or your, you know, clover or something like that. So, and that that's just natural stuff that comes up in the woods. I mean, it's just like us. Yeah, the musk It's just like us. Well, it's like the muscadine, the blackberries, yeah. the... Mm-hmm. You know, so there's things that you don't account for. That's they love that, right? There's things you don't account for that are in the woods. That uh, as long as you're maintaining your your woods and uh, forest and things like that, that are in there that you don't account for that the deer are eating. It's not, it, like I said, it's no different to us. You know, crappie season comes around, start We're catching crappie. Yeah. We stop eating deer, start eating crappie. That's you know right. what I mean? We start eating catfish. You start eating. Rabbit season comes in, we start eating rabbits and squirrels, and you know, and then we kind of get tired of doing that or stop hunting them, and you know, we go to something else. So our our feed patterns are kind of similar to what a deer does in the woods. That's a good segue to start talking about something we're cooking. Man, I'm eating crappy for lunch. Today. <laughs> <laughs> well, you told me I wanted you to tell everybody about uh, those stuffed shells you did with deer meat. What was that all about, Mark? Man, we we've been so busy. Me or my wife, neither one has went to the grocery store or got groceries delivered in probably three weeks. So I'm like back into the back of the pantry, like knocking the dust off the turnip green cans, eating them, you know? So <laughs> I got turnip greens, man, you're hard up. Shoot, them old glories ain't bad. Man, they're good. <laughs> seasoned or unseasoned. Ready to go. Seasoned. Seasoned. With seasoned greens. But uh, we needed something for supper last week. I reached in the freezer, got old bag of ground up deer meat out and took it and mixed up some uh, Italian seasoning and, Got a little bit of tomato sauce out, and I said, hey, we'll make spaghetti. Well, we didn't have no spaghetti noodles. And I, I blew the dust off the, I don't know what you call them, the seashells. They weren't the great big ones, <laughs> the, but yeah. the, the Shells medium of seashells. Cheese. Yeah. I grabbed some of that and had a, was it mascarpone cheese? I only know, I didn't even know we had it. It's probably from Christmas or something. I have no idea. <laughs> That's pretty moldy cheese. Yeah. 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 Knock, yeah. You had to knock the green out? <laughs> we mixed it up with some spinach and a little bit of cream cheese and stuffed some shells and poured that old deer meat. Tomato sauce over the top of it. And I ain't gonna lie, it was it was dang good. It was it was very very good. We have to do that recipe on butt junkies coming up. So you up. went smooth Italian, smooth that Italian. That sounds like a good one. Jamie, what was you doing with duck? Oh man, my nephew Drake come out and we done duck steak on the charcoal grill. Man, they were he, they were they were real good. Well, did he, do you know what he did to them? He marinated them and of course the good old traditional Italian dressing and something else. I don't remember what else he put on it. Oh, it wasn't then, Dale's, was it? No, it wasn't Dale's. No, <laughs> and then that's them, a classic right there. Yeah. Put the prime beef on it and put it on uh, PK and grilled it up. They were real good. Bacon wrapped or just no, regular? just straight, just straight. Just took it medium rare. Real duck duck breast. I had I had people asking me about cooking duck this past week. Well, one of the guys that we hired up here, he's wanting to cook ducks, and he was like, "What is your favorite way to cook ducks?" I said, "Just straight on the freaking grill, just like you cook a steak. I mean, don't take no other way. He don't take no time. Well, he, well, he did, what Drake did. He, I think we'll say he pulled them at like one twenty four, one twenty five, and he had. He had to run three rounds, but he had a had the oven turned on like I think it's like one forty, one forty five, low as yeah. it go, and just put it in a pan and put it in there and just let it carry over while the mother was cooking. But man, they were perfect. You know, they were real good. And that, I mean, I there, I don't, I know there's a bunch of different duck recipes. You can do a lot of things with the ducks. I mean, and, and all of them's good. But me personally, I've always just loved that natural, just grilled deer or duck or you know it's hard to beat it, 
it's in its natural form. You just pretty much putting a decent seasoning on it, and as long as you cook it right, you know, don't overcook it. Man, That's, it is. It's some of the best we, natural, just flavored meat that you can eat. Last year, last hunting season, what have we killed? A merganser, <laughs> one day a pintail, some mallards, and we had what yeah. else do we have? I don't remember because we well, we teal teal yeah we, we had four different species and yeah we'll smack them a couple of mcganzers yeah. down there in the pond so we and you had always heard you can't eat mcganzer right and we yeah. talked we about eat this them before jokes. just like you said though seasoned and hot and fast super hot and fast on the grill no bacon no fat no nothing else dude that's some good eating duck the only time I've ever cooked waterfowl where I was like it tasted good but it smelled not good was the most snow geese. And they tasted great, yeah. But they smelled like a fart and feet when you was cooking them. Hard. Like <laughs> they was, they had a different smell. But yeah. you would, like tasting it. I mean, it tasted like a tastes like a mallard to me. But no, it's hard to beat some some duck. And I, what I like about duck is it's even rare. It's great. But even if you cook it to make like a gumbo or something yeah. like that, it's got so much rich flavor as that dish that a lot you can't get with chicken. You yeah. can't get with any other meat you buy from the store. That's what I like. We need to do a quick recipe on how to hot and fast duck and show people how far you should take it. And because that was always my big turnoff. Every time I went and ate duck, somebody cooked, they wrapped in bacon, maybe jalapeno popper or whatever, Mm -hmm. and cooked it till it was dry, tough, and livery. That's all it was. And that's how I thought all duck was until I started hanging out with y'all and we started cooking it just scaring it over hot coals yeah they when, when they do life. that they're trying to get the bacon done and yeah. in order to get the bacon done the duck's overdone yeah. so i think a lot of people's <clears throat> mindset is it's a foul so it's a got to like it. a chicken yeah. so you got to cook it to well done. 165 180 yeah. degrees for it to get done and you don't it's it's not that type of bird you know and, you yeah. want to cook chicken and turkey to you know the One safe temperatures yeah, yeah. But a duck, you can you get away with it. Don't ask me why you can get away with it because I don't know the. It's red meat. Like, it's, re- it's yeah, red. Yes, meat. it is. It's yeah. red meat. Yeah. Don't have no nothing added. Yeah, I tell you, well, something. dove's the same way. Yeah, mm-hmm. you cook dove. I, mean, I, I hate dove when it's overcooked. But you I think a lot of people must barely cooked. They mistake the juices coming out of it as being blood and it's rare and it's gonna make you sick yeah. and it's undercooked and it really ain't. It's not yeah. I mean, I've I've cooked some duck sometimes where I took it at one twenty that it was eh, it was right there at that on the rare verge. on the rare side. You know, I would have preferred to put it back on the grill for another minute, but <laughs> it's still dang good. It's good. But it was still it was really oh, yeah. good. It did not. And I mean, deer's the same way. I mean, Malcolm's cooked a steak down at camp one time where he butterflied those loins out and we eat them, and that's just as good as any freaking ribeye I've eaten in the or stack on the store. Yeah. I can tell you what I did cook. I mean, in a restaurant, yeah. Well, I did cook. It was good. Them hogs we've been cooking. I've been I've been stealing the loins. Inner loins. Of, yeah, and man, oh, good. <laughs> I, I grilled them. Up. It is no comparison a fresh hog comparison to what what you get in the grocery. Sorry, y'all ready to cook a wild hog hole? Would I'll you do it? it? Would I'll you do, do it? it? I would. So, I've actually talked to one of the one of the hogs players we get, and talking to him, he says the difference is you can cook a wild hog. But you got to get it over that 165. So you can roast one or smoke one and take it to 190, 200. Cool. Yeah, and you know it's it's good. He said, now he don't recommend eating one at 130 or 140 like we would a store bought hog. Yeah. But even the loins, you don't eat a 135, 140. He said degree. he wouldn't because you don't know what they're eating. Yeah. That's the thing is like they're I'm eating. Scared of, I'm scared of. I'm scared of the black pathogen. I think that ain't no scared. joke. Um, I've read that thing about those worms and that stuff like that. Getting heart I'm worms worried from about that. Yeah. But them guys hard in point, them son of load them up and carry them to the house. They don't, I don't care, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Something else I've learned, I'm gonna, I want to talk about this, because I, ta- I told you yesterday, you know, we've ate alligator several times. Yeah. And it's hit or miss. I mean, you can get some at a restaurant, fried gator, it's it's all right, you know. And we've I've done, done, a, video on we've done a video on smoked gator, and I mean, it's good. So my buddy Jody brought some over. His wife actually won a hunt down there at that – What's the name? Is it God's Country Outfitters in Florida or something like that? You got me. Got it's a big outfitter in Florida. Yeah. And she killed, I want to say it was 13 or 14 foot. I mean, it was looked like a dinosaur, a big gator. And what they do is they take it, they har- they harvest and dress the gator, and then they give you the equal amount of, you know, already processed gator meat back. So he brought some over, and it was steaks. And they were 
cleaned up, no fat on them, no nothing, and they've been run through a meat tenderizer just like we do at deer camp. It's almost like, almost look like minute steak. We breaded it's that pure white meat. Pure white meat. It's well, it, it's light meat. I ain't gonna say it's white meat. Yeah, but we battered it, fried it. We, we cooked some crappie and fish, catfish and stuff like that the other day. Battered, cut it, it up like in the strips or no, no. I left it whole. I mean, it like was a looked, fried minute steak. Yeah, it looked like yeah. fried minute steak. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was some small pieces in there, dude. That was some of the best. To me, it tastes like the best chicken thighs you've ever fried. Hmm. I mean, it was it was a it was the best gator I ever had, yeah. no doubt. But that's what he said. He said, man, they got a whole processing plant down there that they make sure they, they take all that fat out. And they said they won't, if I understood him right, they won't touch the tail. They say the tail is the worst part to eat on that gator. Where do they get the meat from? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if they cut them loins out of that uh, tail or, yeah. you know, where they got it from. Mm. That's about all the meat. When I cooked one, of, there was. I mean, you had a little on the legs, but not much. They yeah. got, I, mean, I'm I guess sure it would have loins. Got tender loins like, yeah, like hog, But, yeah. I mean, this right gator is – yeah. Twice the size of this table we're sitting at. I mean, this wasn't no yeah, little. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, this was a wasn't gator. No little gator. Yeah, wasn't no grill gator. It was like biblical portion size yeah, gator. Yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> it's the biggest thing I ever seen. But I'm sure gators just like duck. I mean, we just talked about cooking duck the wrong way. I mean, when you get those high processed, oh yeah, gator nuggets and stuff like. But I mean, I've eat I've eaten fried gator nuggets in like a restaurant where they you could tell that wasn't didn't come out of a bag. Yeah, yeah. It didn't it didn't have that old chicken nugget coating on it. <laughs> <laughs> It was just about Louisiana they, fish fry yeah, or something. Yeah. They they had actually. Is that what you used? Yeah, I used the Louisiana chicken fry. It was yeah. good, and it's a world of difference in the two. So, hey, talking about gators, I, I wrote down some comments and questions on here for us to wrap up with. But uh, the last one was about gators. This is this is our buddy uh, John Herring. He said he lives down close. I don't know if he's from there, but he lives close to Dark Butler Lake now. <laughs> and he said he replied. He replied. So they ever seen a gator down there around Arkham Butler, which is close to us. He said 100% he's seen gators down there. And you don't even want to get him started <laughs> on the black bears and the cougars he's seen down there. So have y'all ever seen any cougars down there around Arkham uh, Butler? Yes. Even I've in our house. I've seen a big cat. I don't know what it is. I've seen a big cat. At the, at the bar or at yeah. in the wild? <laughs> 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 <It's> Both. <spillway. laughs> That's what I've been I was in the thinking. hand shack a few times. There was a couple <laughs> hanging around the pool There's table. <laughs> But you've said, y'all seen some big cats? I don't want to mess with the black bear at the pool table. <laughs> yeah. The black bear. You leave that one alone. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. So, so have y'all heard some cats or seen yes, some I cats have. out there? Yeah. I've heard the cats at the house, and I've 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 physically seen cats over, uh, what's the bottom over, headed across towards uh, Bahia? Dark or, Corner, or Lewisburg. Oh, uh, yeah, I know what Box Corner. Box Corner. Um, me and Tracy almost hit one coming back from deer camp one night over there, and I've I've seen them out of the deer stand, out around Arkham Butler Lake, hunting out there before, uh, black ones. Yeah. So it, lo it looks like a black panther. It didn't look like a mountain lion, but the one we've seen over here in Box Corner, it looked like a mountain lion. It was bright. It, was it actually, it actually mm. was a guy on trail camera picks <clears throat> year before last that was almost by John in this place up yeah. here at Shimpock Hill, and he had a cat on camera. It was it was big, but it was, it was more of a lighter color. It wasn't a dark, dark yeah. color. And I, I think they the Florida – I think it's the Florida Black Panthers is what what they are. They they're actually, you know, they're black. And then we, you know, we they've got an, another kind of like cat that's similar to a mountain lion color. Uh, it's not as big as a mountain lion. You know, they, things are monstrous. My dad's seen some cats, which I mean, I've seen them at our house, but he caught that. He caught a game. He said it was a puma. What it was, puma, or something, yeah, yeah something along that line. Well, I mean, was there different <clears throat> cougar, a puma, a mountain lion? Man, I, thought I, all same, I thought it was all the same cat. A I cat? think they're probably all the same breed. It was yeah. kind of like a deer. You know, they're kind of yeah. smaller in, oh, in, in size down I mean, here. Panther's a pretty good size up cat. North and they're Heck freaking yeah. monsters. I, mean, I don't want to mess with none of them. Are. You know how bad freaking Smokey is, and it ain't but a ten pound cat. You imagine? I wouldn't want that old Bobcat. We got stuff to come. No, <laughs> that joker got a hold of you. He'd mess you up. That's the only thing in the woods I'm scared of. A bobcat? A bob? No, no, oh. a panther. Oh, a pan oh, really? Are you scared of a bobcat? Mm -mm. I don't ever think about that. I ain't scared of the b black bears or nothing like that either. But <laughs> if we had grizzly bears, I would be. <laughs> yeah, black bear don't scare you. No, I'm good on everything. To it's about dark and it dang coyotes <laughs> yeah. get to howling. I cannot stand that. Jamie ain't scared. This is the what the cricket's got. Him scared. Jamie, <laughs> Jamie, ain't Jamie scared. Of the he's dark. not scared of the dark. He's scared of what's That's in right. the dark. Uh, <laughs> you know, at the dark, it's what's yeah, in it. What's in it? Or what you can't see. Yeah, what, what you, you can't don't see. know is there. <clears throat> yeah. no, I've seen we've seen I've seen two cats at our house. Uh, I think it's been four or five years ago now. But and then with building our house in 2014, I was out in the yard and I heard a cat, which had been about before Mark's house was there, so it would have been between mine and Mikey's house. 
Yeah. It was, it, it, it's what they say it sounds like it does sound like that. It'll make yeah. hair stand up. Really? It sounds yeah. horrible. I had never it's seen pretty wicked. It sounds horrible. But you think about a, a, a house cat. I mean, everybody's messed with a house cat before and pissed it off. And oh, it, it, it you grabs alive. you, you know, it, it locks on your arm and you can't get it off. You imagine a 100 pound, with a 70 to 100 pound being. cat lock on you like it. You'd be standing there looking that thing in the face. Yeah. It'd rip all your guts out with his back mm. feet. <laughs> I wouldn't want no part of it. There ain't no way. All we got to do is outrun you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, y'all ain't, yeah, you ain't got to worry. I'll be slinging lead. But <laughs> no side piece. <laughs> just popping something. I don't know. Y'all better watch out. We better be in front of Malcolm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I ain't shooting forward. I'm shooting behind. <laughs> That's for sure. Nah, that's, what, that's what they're going to do. They're going to shoot us. They, stop, they stay, ain't got to run. They can, stop, yeah. they can stop me to us, but I can just keep on going. That's shoot Mark one. in the get, foot. Get yeah. him in the ankle. <laughs> yeah, wound him. I'm sorry, Mark. No, don't I'll go. I'll be right back. <laughs> I'm going to get help. Going to get help. Going to get help. help. Yeah, I'm going to get help. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, if life or death depended on it, that ankle ain't going to do me no good. I'm going. Yeah, you're going. You're going to be going on three. <laughs> yeah. We tripoding it. <laughs> we had one, uh, a couple other things real quick before we get out of here today. Uh, Mike Little. He responded to we put out that video of putting up that sausage from right. the freezer, and I don't think we showed it in the video. But his suggestion was flatten those packs out. Well, we already do it. But yeah, you already own that, ain't you? Yeah. That's what, if you look at our freezer, why do you do that? So we flatten them out for a couple of reasons. A, it's easy to store. You can stack them up just like books on a shelf. Put them in that freezer, and you can put ten, fifteen pounds in a small space. You know. Yep. But what I my favorite thing is like if you want to you get off work at five o'clock get home you want to cook some ground deer you ain't got to wait on it to thaw you take that and drop it in the sink five minutes it's thawed that's what I was gonna say it's not so dense so no it's easy. you can work with it and that's if I buy if I buy bulk ground beef at the grocery store I do the same thing I vacuum seal it and flatten, flatten, it, flatten it out matter of fact what do I have at the house from this year our our main kitchen refrigerator freezer at the bottom it's got like them slots where you put frozen pizzas. Yeah, you can stack them right in there where the frozen pizzas go. I much rather eat ground deer and the frozen pizza. Yeah, so. yeah, you're right about that. Well, there was one other person. I don't know if you know this person or not, Mark. No, but he knows us apparently. Yeah, he knows you. What's his name? Carl Ken Walters. Ken Walters. He wants to know the story about your buddy that got hung. Would he get stuck up in the stand on the bluff? He or got something? scared of the heights. Is what he done. So what is what you got time to tell us? Yeah, well, we got several stories. So if y'all want to hear more about this fella, we got plenty to go. Jamie's got probably one of the funnier ones I've ever heard. But <laughs> we uh, that one. we were hunting in Abbeville, opening morning deer season. That was on government land, and we actually Mikey actually hunted this spot first, but it's on a huge bluff between a couple of ridges, and it's a big bluff drops off on the bottom. Got a canal goes through it. How and, far are you talking? The bluff, I think, yeah. probably 30, 40 foot high, probably. Yeah, and it's it's steep, steep. It's it's like a big straight hit. down thirty four feet. No, it's probably thirty or forty if yards. If you slipped oh. off of it, yeah, you would go straight to the bottom. So, but we, you can climb up it if you needed to. Yeah. They, they cut fire lanes, and what I would do is we park the side by side, and we get on that fire lane, and we just walked the fire lane. The fire lane would run that ridge right up the top. So we got up there, and I said, "Man, that's a good tree right there, pine tree. No no limbs on it. Just climb right there." And I helped him get a stand on. He got on trees, shimmied up. I said, you need to face that way. So when you get up, shimmy around and look toward the creek. He's all right, good. So I dropped off the bluff, went on down the levee. We hunted all morning. I think I killed a little eight-point or something. I can't remember what it was. Well, I was walking out to get him. Well, I'm walking up the bottom, and he's up on the bluff. And, I mean, when you're in the bottom looking up, it looked like he was 200 foot up maybe. I mean, he was, like, <laughs> up there. So I get up there, and I said, well, come on down, you know. And he's he wasn't coming down. And he's like, what? He said, man, he said, I done messed up. He said, I didn't realize it was dark this morning when I climbed this tree. And he says, I had no idea I done got this high. I mean, he was, he like, I was at the bottom bluff, and he did. It looked like I was 200 foot from him. I walked up the bluff. And he was up at the top of that tree scared. Well, what he done is the tree was on the edge of the bluff. So when he shimmied up at 10 or 15 foot and he swung his stand out over it, it was 150 foot down, <laughs> looking like, you know. He wasn't looking behind uh-uh. him to see what the other side. So if I it was got, that far on one side, it had to be far on the other. So I got on the fire lane, and this boy is like a squirrel latched on once it got daylight. He said, man, I didn't even know if I seen a deer. He said, I was scared to look out the window. Like, I had my eyes closed. You know? come back down. I walked up there, and I reached up, and I grabbed the bottom of his stand. He wasn't six foot off oh, the ground. Oh, no, you can touch it. <laughs> I said, hand me your gun and get down. <laughs> he was scared to death. He was trying to shimmy around, trying to get back on that, that shallow side. You yeah, know? He was, all, was he all right once he got turned? Uh, he was still pretty shook up. Really? He, he didn't go back to that tree? No. He wasn't a little boy at the time. And, uh, he, he's probably he, five by five. Yeah, he, <laughs> five by five. <laughs> he earned the name Billy Bob because that's exactly who he was, Billy Bob off Varsity Blues. So, <laughs> But, no, it was that was one of the good stories. We hunted 
heck, up until about two years ago, every up in the morning we hunted together in Abbeville, and we had a bunch of stories. It was it was several. We'll have to get back into some of those now. <laughs> well, well, that about does it for us today, fellas. That's it, man. We uh we appreciate y'all listening. As always, y'all make sure to check us out on all the podcasts, YouTube, you name it, all the platforms. We try to get content for y'all. Always check out buttjunkie.com. Again, probably, what do you think, mid, mid-summer mid we should have some stuff hitting? Yeah, probably mid-summer we should have some cameras and yeah. things like that that we're – We'll, we'll have some good about. some stuff we like to use and stuff we like to promote and we've had good success with so y'all check it out but always we'll see y'all next week we gone